For many, Rover's peak was in its post-war but pre-British Leyland era, and that usually means the P5 and the P6. But one Rover that gets comparatively no love is this one, the poor old P4, the company's first all-new model since World War II. So why is that? Why does no one really talk about the P4? Well, we're going to take this delightful Rover 95 for a drive and find out. But first, our friends at Lancaster Insurance are running monthly giveaways. You can win all sorts, from experience days to tools, restaurant vouchers and tech. So check the video description for full details and to enter. Sometimes you've got to admire the British spirit. Immediately after World War II, Rover were keen to get back to producing premium upmarket cars. So much so, in fact, that they restarted production of their pre-war models, and they introduced a new overhead inlet valve engine in models that they coined the 60 and the 75. In truth, though, these new models were only ever seen as a stopgap by the Wilkes brothers, who wanted an all-new Rover, and they were heavily influenced by America, particularly Studebakers. So much so, in fact, that they bought a 1947 Studebaker Champion, removed the body from it, and grafted it onto a prototype chassis for the new Rover. They liked it so much, in fact, that when the final designs were approved, they changed very little from that original Studebaker. Less than four years after the end of World War II, at the 1949 Earl's Court Motor Show, came the new Rover, the new 75, which had become known internally in the factory as the P4. It was powered by the same 2.1 litre engine that Rover had shoehorned into the reproductions post-war of their old models, but now it featured twin carbs and more importantly the body that that engine was carting around was quite a lot lighter than it seemed. Steel was in short supply after the war, so when Rover went to press steel to manufacture the body panels they made the doors, the bonnet and the boot lid out of what was called Burma Bright, a combination of magnesium and aluminium that were far easier and cheaper to get hold of. Now Burma Bright it had two desirable qualities. For one, it doesn't rust like steel does, because of course it's part aluminium, and for another, it's remarkably light. For as much as this was designed to be a prestige and upmarket car though, Rover were keen to offer value with the new car. In fact, it was a useful £115 cheaper than its nearest competitor, the Riley RMB. The Studebaker-inspired styling drew attention, but one element of it wasn't quite so popular, and that was the central spotlight located in the middle of the radiator grille, and affectionately nicknamed the Cyclops Eye. Now, it's not a particularly attractive styling trait anyway, and it later emerged that in hotter climates and under extreme circumstances, it would block enough airflow to the radiator for the car to overheat. Not a good start. But Rover had high hopes for the new model, and they weren't about to let one styling stumbling block hold its success back. By 1952, the Cyclops Eye had been styled out of the grille, and that gave the car a much more elegant look to it. By 1953, more improvements had been made. Several Rover customers had balked at the idea of the column shift on the early cars, so instead they introduced a manual gear lever that came from the centre of the car, but was curved so that a third passenger could still fit. The other big change made in 53 were some new trim levels. There was the base level 2 litre 60, which offered a more affordable entry point, and the top of the range 2.6 litre Rover 90. Now a six cylinder engine in this upmarket luxurious cabin might give off the impression of a Jaguar, but if I'm honest, this is by no means a Jaguar rivaling sports saloon when you get onto some twisty bits. The steering is vague to say the least, it's heavy and there is no feel for it whatsoever. Whoa the lean. Yeah, you've got quite a high up bus like driving position which does give you a nice commanding view of the road ahead but it does also mean that tipping into a corner and you do feel a bit like you're going to end up on the passenger seat. But that said, that six cylinder engine is a gem. It's watch smooth, there is no vibration from it whatsoever and it must be said, it sounds glorious. It wouldn't see which way a Jaguar went, but it is an experience. With the torquey engine and these lovely surroundings, there's no point trying to hustle the P4. Far better to just get it up into top gear and waft along. Appreciate the cabin, which is 
a combination of all the best bits of classic British saloon cars. I've got acres of wood, lashings of leather, lovely chrome touches here and there. And in this particular example, a previous owner has retrimmed the door cards in red suede. It's not original, but I rather like that. And it is a comfortable car as well. It's really soft and it attacks bumps in a way that Classics Monthly editor Simon Goldsworthy described as being like a steamroller. After the addition of extra trim levels and a more traditional gear change, Rover kept up the momentum of improving the P4. In 1954, David Bache redesigned the back end and kind of lifted and extended the tail to give it a more capacious boot and added a wraparound rear window that brings more light into the cabin and makes rear visibility an awful lot better. And the momentum kept coming. In 1956 came the 105R, powered by a high compression version of the 2.6, it developed 108 horsepower and was comfortably a 100 plus mile an hour saloon car. What's more, you can have the 105R with the Rover Drive automatic transmission, a two speed auto. That fun fact for you is actually the first ever British built automatic transmission. After what many argue was peak P4 with the 105R though, you might imagine that when the P5 was introduced in 1958, that Rover would quietly sidle this car off. But no. In 1959 came the P4100, which featured leather, standard heater, standard overdrive, and servo-assisted front disc brakes. You don't do that kind of development on a car that you're going to be killing off, do you? By 1962, 13 years into P4 production, and not to mention 4 years into P5 production, you might imagine that this model had done all it was going to do. But no, there were yet more variants added. The 95 that we've got here and the 110. Now the 95 is arguably one of the best all-rounders in the P4 range. It was a 100 but re-geared for fuel economy with a really short first gear and it was actually cheaper than the outgoing four-cylinder Rover 80. So even by that point in its life, the P4 was still a hugely appealing purchase. In 1964, the Burma Bright doors were replaced with steel ones after some complaints that hard slamming of them could cause the door skin to dent. But in doing so, Rover, if anything, improved the quality. By a heavy thunk when you shut the doors and a nice weight when you open them, it gives this car yet another upmarket, solid, well-made feel to it. As it must be said, this car carries in general. It feels like a solid, hewn piece of metalwork and that it really does stand up today. It doesn't rattle, it doesn't shake, it doesn't feel seven decades old, which it very nearly is. In 1964, road and track journalist Bob Dearborn said of the P4, I believe there is no finer car built in the world today. And in truth, you can see what he was on about. It's comfortable, it's luxurious, it's premium. In six cylinder guys, it's remarkably sporting and it's got a feeling of solidity and dependability that Rover was striving for post-war. It might not be the muscular P5B or the trailblazing P6 and perhaps that's why more people don't talk about the P4. But what it is, is a reminder of Rover's golden age. That once upon a time, Rover really was the best of British. This video is proudly sponsored by Lancaster Insurance. Give them a call on 01480 400 889 for an insurance quote on your classic car. And don't forget to click the link in the video description to enter their latest competition.